Thank you all for being here for this morning of conversation with Drs. Julie and John Gottman um, about their necessary book, Eight Dates, um, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. I am privileged to be sitting here with you guys, so thank you, Lonnie and Fan, for inviting me to do this. Um, and I feel I'm here in three basic capacities. I'm here as a clinician, I'm here as a consumer of your work, and I'm here as a wife of almost 25 years. My anniversary is in a weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, good. And as I read your book, I was excited to date my husband again, you know, <laughs> and to date him with intention um, and to explore a deeper um, connection with him. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with you guys when you say that making your relationship last is a choice. And I think that those of us here in the room who work with couples um, strive to help couples make that, that choice a reality. Um, as the title of the book says, it's, in, it's um, organized into eight conversations. Um, and the eight conversations are topics that every couple should, um, should have. And they are trust and commitment, addressing conflict, sex and intimacy, work and money, family, fun and adventure, growth and spirituality, and dreams. Um, in your introductory chapter entitled The Conversations That Matter, which I think is a master primer for couples in, about your research and your, your training, you use a beautifully powerful metaphor about love as action um, instead of only a feeling. And you invite couples to be curious and purposeful in the practice of love. In it, you say, perfection is not the price of love. Practice is. We practice how to express our love and how to receive our partner's love. Love is an action, even more than a feeling. It requires intention and attention, a practice we call attunement. So I want to ask you guys to share with us um, how the idea of using date night in this intentional way to find attunement developed. Hmm. Ella? Yeah. So here's, here's what happened. We were working with couples who had been together for decades and decades, but they were very, very distant from one another. They didn't know each other anymore. During courtship, they may have asked each other a lot of questions, but during the decades, as they were raising children or developing dual careers, they didn't take time to connect. And as a result, because each individual was evolving, and perhaps diverging from the other partner, they hadn't taken the time to keep up with who the other individual was in the relationship. As a result, the understanding was gone, understanding values, needs, how beliefs may have changed, spirituality may have changed, dreams as well. And so we knew that in order for couples to really reconnect, they needed to prioritize a pocket of time in which they could address bigger questions, questions that dove deep, that had meaning, that surfaced the perhaps changes in reason for living, purpose, attitudes, political beliefs, and so on. So we wrote the book with, for one, that population in mind. And in addition, what we were also seeing were couples out there on Twitter, on Bumble, on the internet, trying to build relationships, trying to find the right person and asking all the wrong questions. Like, do you live three blocks from me and is your door unlocked? You know, things like that. <laughs> It's like, okay then, <laughs> read chapter three about sex uh -huh. and intimacy. So, you know, in any event, they didn't know the right things to look for in a partner. They didn't know what to ask in terms of seeing, is this person right for me or not? So we wanted to write a book with those topics in mind also. How do you really get to know somebody for the first time and determine whether or not that individual is a partner with whom you can share the next 50 years with, right? How do you determine that? What questions do you ask? What do you find out? 
So we knew there was overlap between those two populations in terms of what was important. So, John, you want to tell them about the survey that we did yeah, to find right. out more? So we actually recruited 300 couples. And by the way, thank you for that wonderful introduction. You know, it was so beautiful. Yeah. Really, it really is what we want to say. Well done. And so we got 300 couples to agree to tape record their date. So we got to listen to 2,400 days. Mostly I listened to them. Uh, and I did the cooking. <laughs> I'm basi basically a voyeur, so it's really a lot of fun to observe couples going on these dates. And turned out that uh, we also had these webinars with the couples who, who wanted to take, give us feedback so we could fine tune the dates. And I also got a chance to go on YouTube. If you haven't done this, it's really entertaining. Uh, YouTube has videos of first dates. And most oh. of them are really a disaster. You know, <laughs> people drink a lot because they're so nervous. And then they drink during the date, and then they ask one another questions like that, uh, the ones you gave. And, you know, and they really don't learn anything about each other. A few dates are really quite nice. Um, so, so we just thought giving people questions, very much like Arthur Aaron created these questions for falling in love. Uh, these questions are open-ended questions. So none of the dates are confrontational. They're all about really finding out who this person is and opening, really, curiosity, again, about your partner. And it turned out that you know, these dates actually worked to make the conversation go a lot deeper and help people connect and have more intimate connection with their partner. Um, but 37% of the couples were in new relationships, brand new relationships. 63% were relationships really that had grown distant, but people knew each other for a long time. So the dates were really very interesting. And, and for all of them, I think um, the couples told us that each date planted a seed for many more conversations around these very big topics, like what are your dreams? Uh, how can we have more fun and play in our relationship? You know, what, what works sexually for you? you know, what, what's your love map, your erotic love map? And so all of these conversations really wound up doing exactly what we hoped they would do, which is rekindling curiosity. Are there, are, were there dates that you tested out that didn't really work as well? Topics yeah, we had, we had two duds. Um, <laughs> and. You know, and, and we wound up being able to fine tune the remaining dates so that they were much more interesting in terms of generating uh, curiosity in one another. For example, if we just asked about work, uh, you know, we really got nothing. But when we started combining work and money, people started talking about, well, what's the history of money in your family growing up? How did your parents deal with money? <laughs> You know, well, were there issues there? How do you want it to be in our relationship? What's your own personal legacy with money? Uh, has it been hard for you? Did you have a hard upbringing? How much money is enough money? What's, what's the meaning of money? And uh, I analyzed 900 dates at one point of arguments about money. And people really were arguing about the meaning of money, not just about money. And I stopped at 100 meanings in those arguments. So wow. money can mean love, caring, power, competence, uh, justice in the world, all kinds of meaning. So we try to get into that sense of what does it mean? What does money and work mean to you? And what's it all for? <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of our work, um, clinical work, revolves around meaning. So how do you, what's your vision about how we as clinicians could use your book as a tool in the therapy room with clients? So, you know, we figure that uh, you can use it as homework, okay. for example. Now, I'm not one that typically gives homework because I don't want, you know, to be a teacher and for my clients to feel judged uh, and graded. <clears throat> so you really leave it as an option. but. In our clinical work, um, let me just check something. How many of you 
uh, know something about our clinical work? How many of you have done a level one training? Okay, so, you know, some of you may understand that we have a theory, seven principles, for what makes relationships successful, whether they're heterosexual, gay, lesbian, or other. And uh, love maps is one of the principles that we really need to help couples to discover and to keep developing. Love maps means how well do you know your partner's internal world and how well do you feel known by your partner in terms of what's important to you inside. We give a couple of interventions regarding developing love maps, one that's fun using a card, a card deck, John loves card decks, and also teaching people about open-ended questions, and we have an open-ended question card deck as well. Well, this particular book is really uh, extrapolating from that particular exercise on open-ended questions, but rendering it fun, rendering it more creative. And so when couples are distant from one another, in particular, this book is a wonderful adjunct to the therapy that you're already doing. Um, and let me just mention something. We are not looking for groupies. We are not looking for a fan club. We know that all of you have had wonderful training. All of you have evolved your own orientation that makes the most sense for you. And as you know, the research out there really shows that the most powerful instrument of any therapy is you, right? You personally and your relationship with your clients. So however this book is used is really up to you and what makes sense for you. But the way that we would probably use it is when people are distant from one another or they're troubled with conflicts about things like money, or sex and intimacy, you know, two of the most common things that couples come in and complain about, their addressing the dates in this book can really be helpful in terms of having conversations about those, perhaps in the consulting room or at home, that allow them to go much deeper in a safe way that doesn't threaten them, that doesn't make one right and one wrong, or to turn the conversation into win and lose. Right. But instead, these are ways of really understanding each other's points of view at a very deep level and where those points of view come from, the origins of those. Whether they're part of how you were raised as those clients are raised, or they're a reaction against that, or perhaps there's something completely separate from that. So what their values are now regarding those particular topics, who they are now. You know, at uh, 25, people's answers to the questions about what you prefer sexually are gonna be really different than if they're 75. We happen to know this, right? <laughs> we have, yeah, you know, so we're no longer athletes or aerobic instructors. So, you know, it's gonna be very different. So, you know, you want couples to speak from where they are here and now in relation to the questions that we're posing in the book. Are there any um, couples facing specific issues or particular difficulties that should make us think twice about having them have this conver these conversations at home instead of in the room with us? Well, it depends on where you are in the therapy, Maru. That's a wonderful question. I love that. You know, we also have couples, um, and even in nice, cool, and calm Seattle, where everybody is from Sweden and very reserved, you still have couples who are inflamed, right? Who come in, they're screaming, they're shouting. I've had couples who've actually, I had one little tiny Irish woman, four foot 11, who clawed her fingernails into my beautiful red leather couch. You know, you have people like that, right? So, 
you wouldn't want to be giving these conversations at home quite yes. yet. <laughs> You've got to give them a few conflict management tools first. Do they have to learn physiological soothing, how to take breaks, how to bring up an issue without exploding the room, um, how to listen in particular, how to attune to the other partner's expression of emotion, and for that speaker, how to express their emotions in a way that is not critical, not contemptuous, and doesn't generate defensiveness. So there's a few things that have to really be established first for couples who are extremely hostile and uh, uh, flooded when they conflict. Mm -hmm. um, changing a little, you, you've mentioned elsewhere that all couples bring different cultures into their relationship by the mere fact of coming from different families. And to that, many of us add ethnicity, race, um, different religions into the mix. So how do you see couples incorporating cultural differences into the conversations? You know, I think that's one of the great powers of this book. Um, we have many, many uh, interracial, interethnic uh, pairings mm -hmm. uh, in Seattle, as a matter of fact. There are 127 languages alone that are spoken in grade schools in Seattle. 127. So we have a huge refugee population, immigrant population. So there's lots of cultural variation. Um, and so the wonderful thing about these questions is that almost in every single chapter, you're asking about how did your family deal with X growing up? And what people understand uh, if they haven't already, is that the cultural differences nurture people's values and beliefs as adults. So they may not understand that, for example, someone from a Chinese background um, will never express emotion in public. It's rude. Or somebody from a Native American population, for example, it is absolutely rude and wrong to make eye contact when you're speaking to somebody. You look at the ground. So many of us couples therapists might think, gosh, you know, they're not really paying attention, they're scared, maybe they're even Asperger's. Well, so wrong. That's a cultural difference. So these questions elicit those cultural differences when asking about the background that can help both partners understand both the emotional expressions and behaviors of the other within a cultural context which I think is really helpful, creates more compassion, more understanding. Well, you know, we often say that every relationship is a cross-cultural experience. Even if you're from the same ethnic right. group, same part of your country, um, same race, you come from different families. Julie and I come from very different families, even though we're both Jewish and white. You know, so when you build a relationship, when you build a family, you're building a new culture essentially culture that's never existed before. So the, it's the way you give meaning to things that really is the essence of culture. And so these dates are not designed to be therapy. They're designed to be fun and play. And really building um, your own intentional system that has meaning for both people. That's kind of what we thought about. Uh, I, I just finished analyzing uh, data from 40,000 couples, gay, lesbian, and heterosexual couples, who took our relationship checkup online. And these are couples about to begin couples therapy. And 80% of them said that fun, play, and adventure had died in their relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, and we don't usually think of couples therapy as a place where we try to build fun, and playfulness, and silliness, and adventure you know, and, and travel together. We don't think of that as the province of couples therapy, but it really needs to be. And so these dates are ways of exploring these areas in a relationship that may be the source of a lot of pain. The fact that 
it's not a lot of fun to be together anymore. In the book, you stress um, the helpfulness of using humor, incorporating humor. Um, at times, I find um, some couples who use, or some members of couples who use humor as a tool to deflect. So how do you, how do you balance that? God. Great question. You know, this woman is brilliant. <laughs> She's thank you. So thanks one to no cool. one, right? Aww. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Thank you for that great question. So, you know, balancing deflection, so humor as a defense, really, from genuine humor um, is really a fine art. So, when somebody, for example, when one partner uh, is expressing a complaint, let's say, about the relationship and is really very emotionally present in their complaint. Let's say they're sad or they're frustrated, they're angry. You can see that emotion, it's palpable in the room, right? And the other cracks a joke and then maybe changes the subject. Well, that's an obvious example of deflection. But what that tells you, of course, you know, you always read under it, right? So it's fear. Mm -hmm. They're afraid. They're afraid of being shamed in front of you, mm -hmm. that you're judging. Uh, they may be afraid that their partner is going to say even more about how terrible they are. They may be feeling despair. They may be feeling hopeless that, God, no matter what I do, it's never enough, right? So. Um, you want to see where there is an incongruence of emotion, where there's an intense negative emotion, then humor. So um, I almost never confront somebody about, you know, so why are you laughing? Um, but instead, just go under it. Uh, so what's happening right now, you know, for you as you listen to your partner? You just read it, but you don't necessarily point it out and shame them even more, right? right? Um, so uh, one has to be fairly balanced. On the other hand, if somebody, this is, this is a more delicate balancing point where somebody is actually getting really flooded. So you know, John's research has a lot to do with physiologically flooding when couples are sitting, having a conversation, sitting there just like you guys sitting there, but their heart rate monitors, they may be you know, wearing pulse oximeters, are reading 140 beats a minute, right? So they're in fight or flight. They're feeling attacked by their partner. So that's a very important point there. And people may use humor at times like that to calm things down, to just soothe. So for example, we had a couple that we filmed in our Masters and Disasters um, videotape series where uh, she was complaining about him always being late. And then he started talking about his background, about how his mom always left him on the swings as a little guy for hours and hours when she was supposed to have picked him up. And you could see he was starting to get flooded as he thought about that. He started feeling so much pain that, you know, the heart rate was like going up. And then he looked at her shoes and he said, those are pretty shoes. Those are nice shoes. Well, she went right with it. She knew that he was calming himself down. And she said, well, they weren't expensive shoes. And he said, yeah, they're, they're really great shoes. Those are really nice shoes. And she was saying, yes, thank you. Yeah, I really like these shoes. They're really comfortable. Down goes the heart rate. Right Now, that's ex not exactly humor, but it's deflection. Mm -hmm. But it's deflection for a good cause. Right. It's taking a little mini break to calm down the partner's psychophysiology so they can stop emitting those stress hormones that are jacking up the heart rate and disenabling them from being able to hear one another 
at a more serious level. So that's a good one. And then, of course, there's the ones who are just teasing each other, laughing at each other, and then they get down to business. That's uh -huh. fine, too. Thank yeah, you. shared humor was really a very interesting puzzle because we found that shared humor, you know, as Julie said, uh, and it replicated that it really decreased physiological arousal. So it's not when one person is funny and the other person doesn't think it's very funny. It's not, right. but humor really that was shared reduced physiological arousal. And Bob Levison found the same thing in his lab. So there were indeed differences in the amount of shared humor during conflict for couples who had stable and happy relationships compared to couples who either divorced or stayed together and weren't happy. But this may be like a um, 60 second difference on average of how much humor there was. But it was very powerful. So then you have the question, OK, well, how do you get people to laugh together when they're disagreeing? How do you do that? And people have actually tried you know, to say, OK, the next time you guys talk about his mother, uh, have your lip corners go up and join me in going, ha, 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 ha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to you know, right. get them to have more humor or be conscious of humor. It doesn't work. Right. So how do, you really? get, how, how do you get humor into a conflict discussion? So we discovered, or well, one of my graduate students, Jenny Driver, discovered was that there are these small moments when people are just hanging out together where one person will try to connect emotionally with their partner might say, hey, honey, uh, take a look at that boat going by. And, and if the partner goes, oh, yeah, nice. You know, we call that turning toward. So that turned out to be a really big predictor of the future of the relationship. Couples who stayed together happily turned toward these bids for connection 86% of the time. And the ones who eventually divorced 33% of the time. So it turned out that there was a connection between the amount of turning toward these bids, these attempts to connect emotionally, and shared humor. OK, correlation. But we actually did the experiment. And when you increase turning toward, humor spontaneously emerges so, during conflict. So it's really interesting that, mm -hmm. that there actually is a relationship between everyday emotional connection and humor during conflict. So friendship and intimacy is connected in a very strong way to what happens during conflict, which is really interesting, mm -hmm. I think. In your first date, you have couples um, explore trust and commitment. And right. the chapter lists potentials, examples of betrayals. And infidelity, of course, is one of them, um, which is a very common presenting problem for those of us who work with couples. And many of these couples, um, when they talk about, when we, they're working with us on this, they mention forgiveness um, as, a, as a constraint, as a block to getting over what happened, because they feel that if they forgive, they're condoning the, the, the betrayal, mm -hmm. um, which is not really what we're asking of them. So I wanted to ask you both to talk about um, forgiveness, how you define forgiveness, and what do you see the, its role to be in the therapy room? Mm, great question. Ah, oh, God, <laughs> this is so fun. <laughs> Speaking of fun, oh boy. OK, so um, first of all, let me just say uh, that my, my background in terms of the individual therapy work I did for about 20 years before joining with John 23 years ago with couples uh, was with folks who were heroin addicts and PTSD, primarily PTSD survivors, including rape, incest, combat, uh, torture, um, natural catastrophes, um, and so on, uh, plus folks who also had psychotic problems, uh, access to diagnoses. Um, so, so, all right, so in that context, forgiveness, um, I don't, first of all, the way I define forgiveness is that 
you have, uh, as the forgiver, you have received enough atonement, or perhaps you know enough for you personally, which may be anywhere from zero to 100, to completely um, erase the board, to take the responsibility off of the shoulders of that individual um, and to forgive them. You no longer hold them as guilty. Uh, and you go on from here on out, that moment forward. I do not believe that forgiveness is a prerequisite for any relationship, actually. Um, so here's what that means. When adultery is present, and I think uh, the record that John and I treated together was a couple where the fellow was a world famous guy and had had 57 affairs with three young kids at home. And that's what he could remember, and he fell in love with three of them. And he told, you know, eventually he told his wife all about those in his work with us. So is she going to forgive him? I don't think so. But, but, uh, when treating affairs, um, what we require really um, for the therapy to have a chance of being successful are three stages. One is atonement, mm -hmm. then attunement, then attachment. You know, it's the AAA model. So we could get it to be the first in the phone book, you know, or something. I don't know. Anyway, we came up with that. And atonement, uh, during the atonement phase, um, the betrayed partner can ask the betrayer any question they want to ask. If there's been a sexual affair as opposed to just an emotional or romantic affair, then we counsel that individual to probably not ask specific questions about the type of sex that they had. Here's why, because the betrayed partner is experiencing PTSD. We have found that universally. Um, and the images that come into that person's head, unbidden, will get much, much worse mm -hmm. and more repetitive if they hear the acts of sex being described. Other than that, the person can ask anything they want to. Also, the person who did the betraying has to express remorse genuinely. And they may have to do that over and over and over and over again for the other person to really be able to even crack the door open, you know, an inch to begin to take it in, right? So after those questions have been asked, the uh, also the person who uh, has been betrayed needs to be able to express all the emotion that they have for being betrayed. Now that doesn't mean expressing contempt, expressing criticism, saying you're a dirty rat, you're horrible, you're the worst human being on the face of the planet, I hate you, and so on. Instead, what it means is I am destroyed by this. I feel like my whole world has cracked in two. I don't know who you are anymore. I'm living with a stranger and so on. So they're describing their emotions in ways that may be very powerful and dramatic, but are not crucifixions of their partner, right? And that person needs to hear those feelings, listen to those feelings, and understand and express some empathy for those feelings, and then express that remorse deeply and sincerely because they know what they're uh, doing remorse for. Then we have attunement, which is really building marriage number two, learning all the good marriage skills that people actually need to be successful. And then attachment at the end, where people are trying to recommit 
and they may not be ready. They may have to you know, jump back to the atonement phase again, ask a few more questions. Nothing is perfectly linear. So in terms of forgiveness, maybe they choose to forgive and maybe they don't. It's their choice, ultimately. It's not ours. It's not our job to make anybody forgive. It's their choice and theirs alone. Is there any, um, I work with someone who's been in atonement for almost a decade. So what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> so here's what you do. Uh -huh. Right? <laughs> so, um, so you're working with an individual or a couple? The individual who was betrayed, individually. And you're working with that individual? The problem is you're not working with the couple. I know. I didn't get the couple. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Someone else was Is lucky. somebody else working with the yes. couple? Yes. All right. And what's happening in that couple relationship regarding the affair? Um, in the couple they're, therapy. They're just starting. I they're think just I, starting. I think that part of the okay. mistake was that they answered too many specific Questions Sex about questions. yes, Ouch. and the images won't go away. Well, that oh, totally yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. That totally makes sense. But you see, individual work is never going to work for somebody who's been mm -hmm. betrayed. It has to be a couple interaction. You know, um, there has to be work that's done to heal the relationship. The relationship is the client. Right. So yes, the individual has severe PTSD especially with those episodes being described, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. However, uh, the couple's work is where the real healing can take place. And so what you can do is perhaps help your individual um, to uh, conceive and write down any remaining questions they may have, not about sex, but about other mm -hmm. parts of the betrayal that they can then present to their partner in front of that the couple's, couple's therapist, mm -hmm. right? And help them also create the words to describe their emotions to their partner without the criticism and contempt. That's gonna be the hard part. Yeah. And atonement means more than just remorse. It also means transparency and behavior change. So it's not enough you know, to just say, I'm sorry. So atonement is not the same as confession, uh, and you're exonerated. It's really, there's a lot of work that goes into it. So we guide people through the steps of really healing regrettable incidents that have happened. Uh, it, the deception often is really much more painful than the betrayal itself, and you know, the lying, the, you know, the, you know, because of the betrayed person often, the hurt person is often saying, what's really true <laughs> in my relationship? Mm -hmm. yeah, the where, where did the lies yeah. begin? You know, you know where, where did it stop being real? You know? We uh, created an online training mm -hmm. uh, for clinicians for treating both PTSD and affairs. So, um, I'm enrolling. What? I'm enrolling in the... Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So um, hopefully, uh, whatever the couples therapist is doing, hopefully you're working with that mm -hmm. uh, therapist closely to stay on the same page. Right. Can I say something else about not interrupting you? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Good one man. of the things, <laughs> one of the things that what was so much fun about doing the research about betrayal and commitment is that we got to study uh, what are relationships like where there's no betrayal, where there's loyalty. So to understand betrayal, you need to understand loyalty and strong commitment. So there is a betrayal metric in relationships, even when there's been no betrayal. And what's going on in those relationships is that conflict is a zero-sum game. When, when the conflict is like a standoff, you know, if, if I lose, she wins, and I can't let her win. I gotta win. And so when you have this zero-sum game metric going on in a relationship, betrayal becomes 
pretty much inevitable in the relationship because um, what goes along with it, and Carol Rusbolt is, the, is a scientist who really taught us about this, is that people are always making comparisons between their partner and other alternative relationships. When you have this power struggle, then when there's a conflict, both people are saying, you know, who needs this crap? I can do better. I can do better than Julie. You know, and so, you know, that lady down at Starbucks, she's so nice, but Julie is really, you know, she's kind of negative, you know. And so when you make those social comparisons, <laughs> you're not really that way. I'm just, uh, I, I'm just saying that in, right. in this betrayal metric, people are doing these negative comparisons of alternative, real or imagined relationships. And they get, as they get increasingly lonely in the relationship, they become vulnerable to having affairs or vulnerable to secrets. And that really destroys the relationship. So once you understand what it is that people are doing in relationships where there's loyalty, uh, you can really change that dynamic so that there's more loyalty in the relationship. And it really comes from understanding that what commitment is about is cherishing what you have and nurturing gratitude for what you have, rather than building resentment for what's missing in the partner. Right. So that metric is really something we can work on in therapy, mm -hmm. even if there's been no betrayal. Right. Can you talk to us about attraction in long-term relationships and uh, working with couples who express having lost sexual attraction for each other? Sure. Um, first of all, you have to find out in the beginning was there sexual attraction. Because sometimes there was and sometimes there wasn't. And if there wasn't in the beginning, it's not likely you're going to be able to produce it now. Uh, only because the chemistry that most people experience in the beginning of the relationship may have been missing. So, you know, I'm not saying that as uh, an absolute truth here. I've just seen that most of the time that's the case. Now, given the rest of couples who've lost sexual attraction but had it in the beginning, I think there's a lot of hope for recapturing it. What we've seen is that um, it's like sexual attraction rides on the back of a camel. And there's so many other things in the relationship that probably have gone wrong in order for that sexual attraction to disappear, right? So oftentimes what I've seen is uh, the turning toward that John described where one partner expresses either a bid for connection with the other partner or just interest. Show that you're interested in me. Ask me how my day was. Right? Ask questions about me, not just broadcasting about you. Um, or if I come to you with a particular need that's really important to me, I hope that partner tries to understand why it's important to me and, you know, makes a more informed choice, even if it's no. Or in conflict, if the conflict has been full of the four horsemen, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling, where you know there's physiological flooding and the partner shuts down to self-soothe. If you've got a lot of that going on, and that's been going on for years, how safe are you going to feel as a partner to allow yourself sexual attraction that draws you close and intimately to the other person? You're not going to feel safe enough to allow yourself to feel that sexual attraction so it will be dampened, it will be shut down. Now, I'm saying this also relative to people aging over time. Why do I keep talking about aging? <laughs> Why is that? I'm sick, I'm almost 68. So, all right, so yeah, of you're, course... You're cute. Aww, <laughs> you are too. All right, so... 
you know, what that means is that all the hormones that were flowing at 25 may have slowed to a trickle, you know, at 65. <laughs> so there may not be lots of sexual attraction that are drawing the people to one another. But the cool thing about sexuality is that at any age, when you have emotional connection, you have intimacy, plus a little bit of whatever, massage, touch, affection, closeness, physically, cuddling, warmth, the sexual arousal and attraction will surface. But the relationship has to be safe enough for that to happen. So a lot of times when sexual attraction is gone in a relationship, you don't start there. You start with what's going on in the relationship, right? In order to then create safety for sex to appear. Can I answer that question from the standpoint of science rather than therapy? So the hey. real No, no, I I'm, I'm they not saying overlap, dear. I know. No, but I'm uh, talking about in terms of experimental verification. Um, you know, and the real answer is that we don't know. You know, the real answer to your question is we don't know. But we know we have pieces of knowledge that are really interesting. For example, Helen Fisher and Arthur Aaron have been studying being in love. And so there's, there's been this hypothesis that you can't stay in love with your partner for a long time. It has a shelf life of maybe 18 months. And then you love your partner, but you're not in love with your partner. But Helen, Helen Fisher's research shows that that's totally untrue. You can be in love with your partner, and the brain responds differently when you're in love. There's all this dopamine secreted when the pleasure center lights up when you see that partner's uh, photograph rather than a stranger's photograph. And there's no shelf life. It can go on for 30, 30 years or more. So that's interesting. OK, so now what's the secret to staying in love? And we don't know for sure, but the largest study done was done recently on 70,000 people in 24 countries. And this study that, that uh, my colleague uh, Pepper Schwartz was involved with, a very interesting study because they had that one question. What's different about people who say they have a great sex life, you know, and they're kind of in love with their partner, compared to people who say, it's really bad, <laughs> and we're distant, sex is bad. And what they found was that there were about a dozen things that people did differently when they said they had a great sex life. Now, we haven't done the experiment, the critical experiment, of having the people who have a bad sex life do those dozen things and show that they now have a great sex life. So it's still just a hypothesis. But what's interesting is that the dozen things that these people did in every country, Brazil, uh, China, even parts of New Jersey were included. <laughs> Separate country. <laughs> countries, right, right. Right. And uh, were so simple. They weren't rocket science. They weren't about certain sexual techniques. They said, I love you every day and meant it. They gave their partner compliments spontaneously. They were affectionate, even in public. They cuddled. Julie and I have a cuddle couch. And after dinner, we get on our cuddle couch and we turn on mysteries and watch English people getting murdered <laughs> while we're cuddling. <laughs> so cuddling is very sex important. Life. Right. <laughs> cuddling, you secrete oxytocin when you cuddle, right? So these things, they have, and they have a weekly romantic date, right? So very interesting, very simple things that were about emotional connection. So it looks like what Julie's clinical advice you know, was, it's really supported by current research. But we only have pieces of the puzzle. We don't really understand the whole puzzle. How do you create desire? We don't know, you know. But the pieces are so interesting, and they really do suggest that emotional connection, particularly for women, is the precursor. And there's a wonderful book, um, I, I think it's the best book written on sex. It's Emily Nagoski's book called Come, Come As You Are. are. And it's just a wonderful book to give to clients so they can understand this whole process that's such a mystery about sexual connection.
Thank you. Can I ask one more? Or we? OK, so one, one final question from me. Um, what is the most significant relationship lesson that you each have learned from one of your clients? <laughs> um, OK. This is not a couple, though. This is an individual. Um, the greatest lesson I learned from this person was the vastness of human resilience. So this, just very briefly, this woman grew up in a very wealthy family. She was incested by her father. She never saw her mother, who was uh, a professional musician. Uh, her father was violent. Her brothers incested her. Her father incested her. She had anorexia by the time she was 17. She was thrown in a mental hospital by 19. She had 50 shock treatments. She was diagnosed as schizophrenic. <clears throat> she was in and out of hospitals for about 15 years. She married. She divorced. She became alcoholic, and then she came to see me. And uh, she was no more schizophrenic than you or I. Mm. She was not psychotic. Uh, she had extremely severe PTSD. Uh, and I treated her for her PTSD after helping her to get sober from her severe alcoholism. And in five years, she was, she came in at about the age of 50. Um, she went back to school. She got a master's degree, of course, in counseling. How often does that happen? Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> she had oodles of money. She built, her dream was to build a home for women suffering from depression, a residential treatment program. She put together a board for that, began the process of that. Then she developed ovarian cancer. She was in a therapy group that I ran for women who had been incested. So we met at her bedside um, for about a year and a half. She turned into a saint. She was so spiritually present. She glowed with light. Mm -hmm. And she died on my birthday, and she knew my birthday. And I swear to God, she did that so I'd never forget her. And I never have. <laughs> um, and she taught me that people can rise from the ashes. Human yeah. beings are magnificent. Wow. And I have had hope for the most hopeless people, uh, and they have proved that hope worthwhile. Thank you. Do you want to follow that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I was thinking about uh, this one couple that I worked with quite recently, and they had been to our couples workshop. Uh, weekend workshop for couples, and um, and they had some very serious trauma. There was an affair, um, and a lot of problems in the relationship. And what they did that was so interesting. I work with them in our marathon couples therapy, which is uh, five hours a day for three days consecutively. And before they came to the therapy, they had worked on the regrettable incidents in their relationship using our aftermath of a regrettable incident booklet. Mm -hmm. And they said they had done, done it 100 times <laughs> before they came. No, for all the incidents that had happened, regrettable incidents that had happened in their relationship. So they came realizing that this was going to be work. Right. And they were willing to do the work. And uh, I really learned a lot from this couple, you know, that Therapy is really useful for getting people started on a course of change, but that it really requires so much practice and dedication to really change a relationship and make it into a great relationship, which they are doing. So that's that's the most recent couple I've had that I've learned something very important. Doesn't happen like that. Right. You know, it really takes 
a dedication. And it doesn't happen just in the therapy room. Right.